to an untested smallpox vaccine to the Tuskegee syphilis study. Harriet Washington chronicles the history of medical research on African Americans in her new book, Medical Apartheid. This talk from the Enoch Pratt Free Library in Baltimore, Maryland is an hour 20 minutes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Harriet and I come from originally from the coal places, upstate New York for her and Massachusetts for me, so this is not coal. It's not cold and there's no snow on the ground. So it's a pleasure for me to be here with you this evening to sort of introduce this very impressive lady. As a matter of fact, I, have, uh, I, I wrote the introduction at 4 o'clock this morning. And uh, I want to say that Ms. Washington is an impressive mainstream African American who is articulate, clean, and attractive. <laughs> So, so she's now qualified to run for president. So. But this evening, we will hear her discuss her bombshell release last month, Medical Apartheid. She graduated from the University of Rochester with a degree in English, concentrating in 18th century literature. And then she went to work. I mean, real work. She progressed from being a volunteer at University Hospital's Poison Control Center, where a number of calls were related to attempted suicide, to the lofty position of director. However, new guidelines, which required such individuals to have either an MD or a FOMD degree, resulted in her losing her job. So Harriet then went as to work as a medical social worker before becoming an editor and investigative health writer for several national magazines. She wrote Medical Apartheid while she was a fellow in ethics at Harvard Medical School and the Harvard School of Public Health. She was also a Knight Fellow at Stanford and a senior research scholar at the National Center for Bioethics at Tuskegee University. She's received a number of prestigious awards, including the Congressional Black Caucus Beacon of Light Award and several awards from the National Association of Black Journalists. She is currently a visiting scholar at DePaul University School of Law and lives in New York with her husband, Ron DeBose, who is also a writer. Ms. Washington has been able to combine her zeal for education, medicine, and her interest in medical communications with her journalism skills. Now, I've not read all of her book, but I have read a little over a third of it. And, and she says that she reveres physicians. I'm not so sure about that. And she feels that medical ethics issues are too important to be left in the hands of scientists alone, and I fully agree with her about that. She agonizes, as do I, about the low level of scientific and health literacy that exists in our country today, particularly among our minority groups. When asked why she wrote this book, Harriet Washington replied that first, the subject had never been comprehensively examined. Second, that the neglected events depicted in her book might enrich discussions of medical ethics in this country, and most importantly, that the history she discusses has been dismissed as paranoia, and such dismissal is dangerous. The distrust of medical science and medical institutions in general, in our minority communities in particular in Baltimore, is real. During the 15 years that I served as dean of the University of Maryland School of Medicine, I believe that we had a significant impact in reducing some of that distrust in our community. We have been able to dramatically increase minority participation in clinical research with folks participating as full and knowledgeable partners rather than as objects. While Ms. Washington and I can have some discussion about the state of affairs today, her book is compelling and overwhelmingly on target. If you read it, you will become engaged in the overall discussion of medical ethics, medical information, healthcare and research, which after all was her major reason for writing this book. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Harriet A. Washington. Thank you, Dr. Wilson, for that very generous introduction. And thank you to all of you for being here. You are, of course, the reason I wrote this book 
and it means a great deal to me that so many of you come, have come out here into the city that is so important in the history of medical experimentation, not only with black people, but with all people. Give me a second for my technology to heat up. I can't possibly distill the 512 pages of my book into a single presentation. So what I'm hoping to do tonight is to sort of take you on a forced march <laughs> through some of the um, most important issues that I think the book eliminates. I'm only going to touch on many of them. I won't touch on some of them at all. I'm looking forward to the question and answer period. <laughs> I, think we're, I think it'll be a lot more fun maybe than hearing the presentation. But I um, do hope to tell you enough to pique your interest. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant, and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. These were the words of the U.S. prosecutor during the opening statement of the Nuremberg Doctor's Trial. The Nuremberg Doctor's Trial is what, what people summon up when they want to talk about abuse of medical experimentation. But I submit that we have forgotten our domestic wrongs. And our domestic wrongs have been perpetrated on black people and they underlie today the feeling of black iatrophobia. Iatrophobia is the fear of medicine. And you can read everyone from, especially medical journals, newspaper stories, um, CNN, they'll all talk about blacks' fear of medicine. But it's incompletely understood because the history has been ignored. You know, you can't talk about why black people avoid medicine and research without talking about where this fear comes from. And this fear comes from not overheated black imaginations. It comes from a long and ugly history. That history has been denied, dismissed, and it has been ignored. While we focus on the abuses abroad, you know, places like Nazi Germany, we've ignored things that have happened right in our own backyards, right here in Baltimore, for example. And that is the reason why this book exists. So no one will ever be able to ignore it again. While we're waiting for my slides, <laughs> I want to talk to you about, first of all, what's an experiment? Uh, it comes from two Latin words. Ex means for out of, and periculum means a trial. But a trial in the sense, not of a courtroom trial, but a dangerous trial, like a hero goes through, something that one engages in and you risk success for failure. And that's what happens in a medical experiment. You're trying something and you may succeed and you may fail. And another classic definition was issued by Claude Bernard in 1865 when he said, an experiment is an observation induced with the object of control. So a researcher, an experimenter, is changing something and watching it, and he is controlling that change. The, um, the very early experimentation with black people in this country differed very much from experimentation with whites. And one reason it differed so much is because science and medicine had a whole set of beliefs about black people that they didn't apply to people of other races. Collectively, that set of beliefs is called scientific racism. But if you have to remember that at the time, from the 17th century through roughly half of the 19th century, and some would argue to the present day, Scientific racism was not just a theory, it was science. This is what most scientists believed. Most scientists who dealt with black people believed. And most scientists who dealt with black people were living in the South, because 90% of black people lived in the South uh, up until um, redistribution. So I think we have to look at the very beginnings of research with black people to understand what's transpiring now. I'm not going to um, point out each one of these gentlemen, but I am going to say that each of these people are researchers, very famous, very successful American <laughs> researchers, and most of them have sterling reputations. The gentleman on the upper left-hand corner from the University of Cincinnati is generally credited with perfecting total body irradiation, a technique for treating some, um, some types of cancers. The man in the middle, James Marion Sims is revered as the American father of gynecology. And the guy up in the upper right-hand corner, Surgeon Th General Thomas Perrin, is credited with the eradication of syphilis. Um, all of these men have wonderful reputations, and every one of them abused and mutilated black people in order to achieve these 
these um, reputations. Now, I think this is a very important point. James Marion Sims, these are the covers of two books. And on each cover, there is a painting of him ministering to slave women. But he kept these, he had bought these women, and he um, repeatedly did very intimate, distressing gynecological surgeries with them, repeatedly making incisions in their vaginas and sewing them back up. He was trying to cure a condition called vesicle vaginal fistula, and this made his international reputation. Now, if you notice, these two book covers have the same image. One of them was given permission to use it in 87, and the one on the right was given permission to use it last year. When I asked the owner of the painter to use it for the cover of my book, they said no. And this is a really good example of the type of censorship that has been involved in getting the material for this book. Frequently, I've been denied access to information. And frankly, if Harvard Medical School had not been kind enough to extend my fellowship another year, so that as um, technically being a fellow of the school, I would have access to material I would, I would have been barred from. Um, there, a lot of the material in this book wouldn't be there only because I was able to call people and say, not that I'm a journalist, but I'm a fellow at Harvard Medical School, was I allowed access to some libraries and some collections. So there's a lot of censorship going on. Um, James Marion Sims abused black patients, not just the women in this painting, who one of them had surgeries, 30 surgeries over five years. Only half of them were ever cured. But when he devised his technique, he went north, and he went to New York, became the president of the American Medical Association, um, also head of the New York Academy of Medicine. He went to France, where he uh, attended Prince, Princess Eugenie, and became you know, internationally known as this wonderful gynecologist. But here, back here in the States, he had also, with a slave named Sam, Sam had a tumor. He had a tumor in his jaw. And when he first went, his master first found out he said, well, he's black, he's got a tumor in his jaw, he must have syphilis. And as is typical in the antebellum period, the master did not call in a doctor. The master treated Sam himself. Unfortunately, this treatment, instead of curing him, made Sam much worse. In addition to a very painful jaw, Sam now had a huge tumor inside his mouth and he could no longer eat. Sam was one of the best laborers on the farm and his master wanted to return him to productive labor. And he told Sam, I'm sending you to James Marion Sims, a famous surgeon. He'll cure you. Sam's, Sam said no. He said, I don't want to do it. It'll be too painful. And this is very typical. That's all we know of what Sam had to say, that Sam repeatedly and loudly said, I don't want this surgery. What we don't know is why. Sam might have been afraid of the pain, or he might have gotten wind of Sims' pension for doing sl surgery on slave women or other things he had done. We don't know that. But in any event, the decision wasn't Sam's. It was his master. So he's shipped off. And when he goes to see Dr. Sims, Dr. Sims very kindly asks about his health, invited him into a chair. Mm -hmm. When Sam sat down, 10 strong men who were physicians ran forward and tied him to the chair. The chair had been fitted surreptitiously with boards underneath, making it easy for them to tie him down. They tied him down, and then 15 interested other people, who we don't know who they were. They might have been other doctors. They might have been curious people. Came in and watched while Dr. James Marion Sims removed Sam's jawbone without anesthesia. Oh he wrote it up in the preeminent medical journal of the South, and the, and the journal ran an editorial saying, we are pleased to record this credible achievement of a southern surgeon. This is what is the medical society decided to record about the surgery. Nothing about Sam's, you know, Sam's being abused. That wasn't the focus. The focus was a surgical technique. The focus was the fact that Sims had done this new surgery. Um, Sims also took cobbler's tools to move the skull bones of young children around. I mean, this sort of torture um, passed for medicine. And I think it's really important to understand that the roots of black aversion to medicine um, lie in this horrible history, which has been preserved by oral, 
oral history, but not necessarily focused on in the medical journals. The other thing about antebellum research that's really important to understand is that it was profitable. Economics was a very important part of it. Um, we had scientific racism, which not only provided um, you know, the underpinnings, the permission to do abusive research on slaves, but also provided a underpinning, a, a rational underpinning for, for um, slavery. Because in black people, you had people who could work for a long time in hot sun and not faint. You had people who were immune to malaria, so they said. You had people who were so profligate in their sexuality they couldn't be restrained and constantly bred all the time, which means you had lots of new slaves that you didn't have to pay for. Um, so there, the, every, all the tenets of scientific racism not only supported medical research, but they supported the slave system, which benefited the South and also benefited the North, which indirectly benefited from the free labor of slavery. So I think a lot of this discourse is left out of discussions of um, early medical history of blacks. I think all of it is very pertinent. So um, the, uh, the one thing that's really, really important and caused a misunderstanding, I think, is the idea of fitness versus health. They're not the same thing. One argument one often hears is that, of course, early physicians and owners did not abuse blacks. Why would they do that? because they wanted to keep them healthy. They wanted them to work in the field. You don't want sick blacks, you know, who are unable to work. So of course we invested very heavily in their health. No. What was invested heavily in was their ability to produce work, their ability to produce children, which is new slaves, not their health. These are two different things. Many of the sicknesses that slaves suffered from were compatible with working hard, and many of them emanated from the heavy workloads. So with you know, fitness rather than health as their concern, you saw things like slaves not being immunized for smallpox, as whites were. Why? Because it might leave marks on their bodies that discourage buyers. So it was fitness, not health, that was important. Slaves who were mentally ill, slaves who were chronically underfed and malnourished, slaves who suffered with, from diseases like malaria that kept them not quite sick but not quite well. All these things were perfectly compatible with working hard. So that it was not a concern with health but rather a concern with fitness. In fact, doctors in the South made most of their money in certifying slave fitness, not caring for slaves. This means that if you had a slave for sale and you sold him and the new owner found that this slave had an illness such as syphilis that made him unable to work, um, you would go to court. Doctors were paid a, a large amount of money to testify to slave fitness. Uh, he might earn a dollar for treating a slave, but he would earn $50 for testifying in court. So again, profit is a you know, really important motive in this early um, experimental abuse of slaves. And these I'm going to go through really quickly. They're probably concepts people are familiar with already, and that is that there was a very large um, fascination with the black body. And two very disparate things are being said about the black body. On the one hand, in the words of one doctor, McKnight, who said that the body of the Negro is a mass of imperfections from the head to the toe. But at the same time, the same body could work really hard, didn't get sick the way white people did, and could produce more children. So you've got this illogic here, but it's an illogic that's profitable. Black people were also felt to be evolutionary laggards, by which I meant that they hadn't kept up with whites. In fact, many um, of the so-called experts in black people during this time, people like Dr. Samuel Cartwright, people like um, Dr. Josiah Knott, were convinced that black people were not fully human. Um, they were considered more closer to the apes than to humans. And this also drove, um, this also provided more of a moral underpinning for slavery. It's not morally wrong to enslave someone. In fact, there were physicians who said things like, well, people are saying that slavery is inhumane, and we thought about bringing some orangutans from Africa, but the abolitionists would probably tell us that you know, we had to free them too. I mean, these kind of statements by physicians in a medical context provided a really clear understanding of where they felt blacks fell on the evolutionary ladder. Medicalized display of black people's bodies was very, very important, and I think this is something that's not well understood. 
Um, there have been people who have said to me, why do you devote so much space to this because it's not really um, research, biomedical research in the classic way people think of it. But it was very important because this kind of display drove biomedical research and was indeed part of it. Um, when physicians displayed black bodies, they took unusual black bodies, and they displayed them in a propagandized context. So if you took a very short man and you surgically implanted horns in his head, and you told him not to speak, and you gave him a manufactured identity, he would appear in the circus. Circuses were run by physicians sometimes. He would appear in the circus and be described as not someone who I own, who I made to do this, but this is a typical inhabitant of an obscure African land. Many of them can't speak. Many, and there was also a very strong um, tendency to look at Africans of short stature and compare them to animals, to apes. On the right, the man standing there with the monkey grasping his knees is named Odobenga. And he was displayed in the Bronx Zoo in New York City in 1909. Not in 1600, not the 1700s. It was just a century or so ago. Displayed in the Bronx Zoo. At that time, Darwin's theory of, of evolution was still being um, hotly contested. And it, he was displayed as a very powerful, um, popular argument that here are people who represent the boundary between man and animal. He was put in the zoo with an orangutan in the cage. His cage was littered with bones. And so people who might not read Darwin, who might not be scientifically literate, people who are just sort of, you know, common and um, interested in popular things, they could be convinced by this without picking up Darwin. They could be convinced by this. So this was a very, very important underpinning and part of research with African Americans. The most disturbing and ugly side of um, study of African American body came from anatomical dissection. And interestingly, it happened very all through the country, mostly in the South at the beginning, but then it spread. And what would happen is that during the 18th and 19th centuries, people felt differently about dead bodies than we do today. People usually died at home, and the body was cared for in a way that was very ritualistic and bound the person to his family and society. You would bathe the body, you dress them in special clothes, you take photographs that you passed around to your family and friends. It was very important to have this bonding ritual. And for that reason, doctors weren't allowed to dissect bodies. The only bodies doctors could dissect were the bodies of criminals, especially heinous criminals, who died under a double, section, a double sentence of execution and dissection. So that left doctors in a dilemma. Medicine was um, beginning to evolve, and the Paris School, or the idea that um, doctors should be familiar with the body, was evolving. They needed bodies to study, and yet the law wouldn't give them any. So where did they turn? They turned to black cemeteries. They turned to black hospitals. They turned to charity wards filled with black patients. And a lot of, that, a lot of black people believe they also turned to the streets. I have talked to more Baltimoreans than I would care to tell you, who have explained to me that, within recent memory, you didn't walk around Johns Hopkins late at night. <laughs> Now, I'm going to confess to you that the first time I heard that, I thought, eh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I buy that one. But I had to listen when I heard it from one young man who was very fervent about it. And when I talked to him a bit longer, I found out that he was the son of Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks was a 51-year-old, was a, I'm sorry, a young black woman who in 1951 died, but not before um, scientists at Johns Hopkins took samples of her cell without her, her husband's permission. And these cell samples allowed them to found the line of cell line culture. Because of her cells, polio, there was a cure found for polio within a year. Because of her cells, there have been countless, countless medical innovations, new medications tested and inscribed. Her cells have been probably more valuable to American medicine than the contribution of any other person. And yet, many people don't even know who she is. So when her son told me that, of course, I had to respect it and pay attention. And although usually, in fact almost always, um, people will disparage accounts 
of, you know, there being night doctors who actually took people and killed them and used their bodies, I did turn up one case, one fully documented case, of a Baltimore woman who was indeed killed for her body, and, and her body was then sold to anatomists. That's such a common thing, by the way. It's not that it's a rare occurrence. It's such a common thing that there's even a name for it. It's called burking. It's called burking after the criminal who in England did so many of them that he was eventually caught and hanged for it. So um, this woman was, she was a white woman, but she lived among black people and had a black boyfriend. And she was killed, and her body was sold to a, the anatomy department. So one, there's, there's no evidence of anybody else, but if you think about it, it just might reflect the social realities of, of uh, Baltimore during that time. What we do know for sure is that the bodies of black criminals, but not white criminals, were likely to be given to anatomists. We do know for sure that doctors, as part of their training, sort of a rite of passage, had to learn to go to cemeteries and exhume bodies. Later, they became more um, specialized, and the um, procurement of bodies was left to porters the people who um, were bought by hospitals to um, clean the floors. Uh, and they shared this duty. Their job was to go to the black cemetery and exhume bodies. Grandison Harris is probably the best known one. He was a porter at the Medical College of Georgia. And um, that was his job. We know this because in 1995, construction workers who were renovating the Medical College of Georgia's old laboratory when they broke into the basement, they found almost 10,000 human bones. 75% of them were for African Americans. People in the Augusta, Georgia area, black people had been complaining for centuries that doctors were taking bodies from the black cemetery. And now, in 1995, it couldn't be denied any longer. And what happened to the Medical College of Georgia actually played out across the country. Most hospitals who had access to a black cemetery were getting their bodies there. And this actually is very well documented in the book. It's not anything that's um, actually contested. Part of the reason it's not contested is that um, the physicians themselves were very open about it. If you look at the books in which they write the provenance of the bodies, they were careful to say, we got them from the black cemetery because they didn't want white people afraid of them and they didn't want white people rebelling. Also, there was a, um, the first black professor of anatomy, Montague Cobb, made a study of it in the Cleveland area, where he found out that at the beginning they had used white bodies, but over time, Cleveland, Ohio, medical schools, were using black bodies from the south. So there was a real commerce in shipping black bodies north, often in barrels that were labeled turpentine. And um, it's, you know, just a horrible thing, but this was real commerce. One other thing I want to point out before I leave this rather gruesome subject is that the image in the center is that of a lynched man. When I look at lynched bodies, I'm often reminded of the bodies such as those on the left, which are hard to see, I think, in this image. I'm sorry, but there are cadavers lying on tables. These are black cadavers lying on tables at the Medical College of Georgia. And what's interesting is that if you look at the men in the anatomical dissection photograph. They're looking right at the camera. They're well-dressed. They're wearing ties and shirts and vests. This is because these photographs were sort of a um, class portrait, sort of a rite of passage for medical students. When you look at the photos of lynching scenes, you see the same thing. You see well-dressed white people looking very unselfconsciously at the camera, sometimes very jubilantly, and the bodies were disposed of similarly. Uh, medical students would take souvenirs from the bodies. They'd take pieces of skin. They'd take organs. That's what happened to lynch bodies as well. Bits of skin, organs, hair, could be bought and sold in general stores in the areas where people were lynched. There's a very striking resemblance. I'm not entirely sure what it means, except that when black people saw black bodies on, on uh, dissection tables, I think it stirred up some very powerful emotions quite aside from the idea of bodies being stolen. Through all the incidents of racial research I found, there are certain, in fact, there are quite a few themes, but some of the more important ones are 
Just as in the antebellum period, the same thing happens today. There are economic advantages to these biological beliefs about blacks. There's also a perversion of science to serve non-scientific ends. What this means is that you have these beliefs about black people which are not logical. You can't both say that they're imperfect and that they're more hardy and stronger than whites. Um, but what happens is white people would subscribe to whatever belief would enable them to do what they wanted to do at that period. And display is a form of abuse of research. As I have um, found out about some of these researches, I've sometimes been challenged when I called them secret, because people will say, well, how can you say it's secret if you said you, you read it in a medical journal? And I want them to consider the definition of what a secret is. Marcel Pagnol pointed out that a secret is not something unrevealed, but told privately in a whisper. And that's exactly what happened. Every, everyday people didn't know about this. Black people didn't know about this. But anyone who could read a medical journal would know about this. But who read medical journals? You had to be, first of all, literate in English. And as we know, black literacy has been very vigorously suppressed during most of our history. You had to be able to find the journal. Even today, go to a medical school and try to walk into the library. You know, you may not get in. Medical libraries um, very strictly control who has access to them. And then, should you find a, re a research journal and read it, even if you yourself are college educated, very literate, it's jargon, it's impenetrable. Very intelligent, very well educated people will read a medical journal and have no idea what they're reading. But other physicians know, other researchers know. And also the accounts are boulderized, by which I mean, one, the researcher who wrote in the journal didn't tell everything. He didn't tell the things that put him in a bad light. He might have talked about technical aspects of the research. He might have talked about um, the advances he made. He didn't have to say that he was working on a slave person because, frankly, in certain periods, that was assumed. Another really important question in doing this sort of research is, I'm often asked, well, how can you judge people who acted in the past on the basis of our morals today? We're so much more advanced today. We have a moral framework, ethical framework. We have laws. These things could never happen today. And we can't judge the people back then because they were only doing the best they knew. Well, not really. <laughs> because the historical facts don't bear this out. You know, there were rules. They weren't government rules but there were rules by medical societies and by, you know, just medical um, fraternities about what you did and didn't do to your patients, except in the case of blacks. And then they were routinely flouted. And then, too, physicians and some whites, you know, avoided and opposed racially exploitive research. And when you saw white physicians who did object to it and abolitionists who did object to it, that tells you that it was not commonly accepted mode of behavior. Okay, I'm actually going to not spend much time on these because these are the various code, modern codes. And um, what's really important about them is here we begin to see codified in language, here is what you can and can't do to, to patients and subjects. But the problem is, even though they spelled it out very clearly, there is a belief among a medical, um, American medical researchers that they only apply to Nazi barbarians, you know, other people, not to us. We don't need anyone you know, watching over our shoulders. We can police ourselves. I, um, even though my book has only one chapter dealing with syphilis experiment, I do want to talk about it briefly because it was really important. It is an iconic experiment. And this quote, I think, is really important because when I looked at the documents, the original documents from the experiment, it's very, it's fascinating. The researchers were very, very honest about what it is they sought to do. They sought to deceive 399 black men who had syphilis into thinking they were being treated when they weren't. When you see quotes like this, it, it sort of shines a light into their mindset. The future of the Negro lies more in the research laboratory than in the schools. When diseased, he should be registered and forced to take treatment before he offers his diseased mind and body on the altar of academic and professional education. Thomas Morell, U.S. Public Health Service. They deceived these men. They lied to them, told them they were being treated when they weren't. And what they wanted to do was simply watch the progress of the disease. 
They did not want to treat them. They wanted to document the devastation of syphilis, and what they most wanted to do was to validate their belief, the public health service belief, that syphilis manifested differently in blacks and whites. They believed that syphilis ravaged the nervous systems of whites, the brain, the sight, but that it spared the, the brains of blacks because blacks' brains were undeveloped, primitive. Instead, it only attacked the heart and muscles. And indeed, the researchers did write this up in a study. But when cardiologists looked at the study, they said, it's ridiculous. This is not proven by the study. This is illogical. This is not scientific. So I find this interesting. It illustrates both the um, cruel scientific racism and the logical blindness of these scientists. One thing that has never been written about before that I address in the book is how the study ended. An ad hoc committee was appointed, and it had some of the best minds um, of American politics, medicine, and ethics. Two of the really um, important, pivotal people on this um, ad hoc committee were Ron Brown, who went on to become the U.S. Secretary of Commerce, and Jay Katz, who is at Yale University, a psychiatrist who works in the law school. But the committee was given charges that were way too narrow. They were not given all the information. In fact, the committee never understood that the men didn't know they were in a research study. The committee thought the men had been told this, so they focused on, well, was a study really ethical? Their focus should have been, was lying to these men ethical? Not just was withholding treatment. Um, there was no historian on the committee, and the study lasted for 40 years, from 1932 to 1972. So not having a historian was a very huge omission. Also, very unfortunately, shockingly actually, the members destroyed key evidence. The members of the ad hoc committee decided, after going and getting a collection of oral histories from everyone in the study, researchers, nurses, everybody, they decided to burn it, to burn the tape. And the rationale given was that Eunice Rivers, the nurse associated with the study, they were, they were afraid that they were going to, um, the document would be used to bring her to trial. And they felt, you know, she was an innocent victim, she had been duped, and for that reason they burned the tape. But if you think about that, that's not really logical. Because if they wanted to protect her, the best thing to do was to keep the tape, which gave the account in her own voice. So by burning the tape, they robbed her of her voice. Why didn't they make the tape under seal? They would have done the same thing, protecting her by decide, putting the tape under seal. No one can hear it for 50 years. When she's dead, then you see it. They, they destroyed the evidence. So um, this was just a horrible, horrible event that has gotten almost no attention. The myths around the Tuskegee study, I think, are very illuminating. One of them, in fact, the most prevalent, I think, is that the men were injected with syphilis. The men were not injected with syphilis partly because there was no need to. There were enough syphilitic black men in the area. Um, and because the researchers were so frank about the horrible things they did in their um, notes, I think they would have admitted it had they injected the men. But often, when you hear this fear voiced, and then you hear someone say, oh, that didn't happen at all, that's just your imagination, you're just being paranoid, it's not a, it didn't come from paranoia. The congressional record actually indicated that the men had been injected with syphilis. So this myth actually came from the researchers in the study. It didn't come from black people. There's also a belief that the Tuskegee Airmen had been experimental victims. That one took me a while to, to really try to understand. I thought, hmm. One person pointed out to me that Lawrence Fishburne played both um, one of the Tuskegee Airmen <laughs> and um, a, and a subject in Miss Evers' boys, so maybe that helped to uh, perpetuate the myth. But I really think that it's sort of, um, I think the belief in that myth comes from a sad acknowledgement that Tuskegee University was also a victim of this study. Tuskegee University was the Harvard, you know, the black Harvard. And um, there were so many wonderful things that happened at that university, so many wonderful scientists that came out of it, and yet, what do we remember it for? An abusive study. How am I doing on time? <laughs> okay. <laughs>
One really important aspect of research with black people is that it often results in forbidden knowledge. By that I mean research that's conducted that results in knowledge about black people that's beneficial to black people or to their image tends to be suppressed. For example, pellagra, a disease of the South, syphilis, cholera, and to some extent sickle cell were all considered black diseases. And when research showed that they were not, that research was simply ignored. And public health officials and physicians just continued behaving as if they were black racial diseases. The census of 1840 was very interesting. It helped perpetuate slavery for a while because this census indicated that free blacks were sicker, including much more mentally ill, than enslaved blacks. And so they said it's a powerful argument for slavery. Blacks need to be enslaved. They can't care for themselves. Well, a black physician, Dr. James McCune Smith, one of my personal heroes, <laughs> and a white physician, Edward Jarvis, refuted this roundly, but the refutation was ignored. And this census data was cited for decades afterwards as if it were accurate. Also, blacks have, have indeed been responsible for a lot of medical research, but we tend to ignore the research they've done. Um, Onesimus was a slave who actually developed smallpox inoculation but we never hear his name. And it's always attributed to doctors in, who are walk, working in Boston, whom he taught. <laughs> and black complicity. It's important, not just for the Tuskegee study, but for other research. There's a lot of focus on blacks who supposedly have participated in abusive research. Sometimes they did, but their role has always been exaggerated. Look at the picture on the right. These are scientists affiliated with the Tuskegee study. What do you see there? You see two black scientists, right? Wrong. The man standing there had nothing to do with the study. I don't know why he was included in the photograph. The woman on the left is Eunice Rivers, a public health nurse, a black public health nurse, arguably at the bottom of the medical rung. No power, no agency, no autonomy. And yet, if you think of the study, who can tell me the name of someone affiliated with the study? one of the medical care providers. Besides Eunice Rivers? We don't know, you know, it's only Eunice Rivers. Only her name has survived. O.C. Wenger, Raymond Vandelier, Thomas Morell, Thomas Perrin. These are the men who devised and perpetrated, these are the architects of the study, but their names are not known, only Eunice Rivers. Prison experiments, nationwide, non-informed consent, not consensual, coercion. Prison research is among the worst of the abuses, and it happened fairly recently. Um, it happened all across the country, different areas specialized in different types of research. And um, in Alabama, lobotomies were, were performed on black men in an attempt to control their criminal behavior and mentality. Not white men, only black men. In Holmesburg Prison, where Jesse Williams was a subject, there were a wide variety of researches done, but once again, black and white subject, subjects had different um, experiments. White subjects tested detergents. Black subjects, L LSD and mind-altering CAA experiments. So, the history of prison research is probably the ugliest of the abuse of researchers, and it was a real, very stra strong racial disparity. Fortunately, in 1974, prison research was almost completely ended for a variety of reasons. Um, syphilis study brought publicity to abuse of research. The Attica riot. The Attica riot actually made many me medical researchers afraid to go into prisons. Also, the rise of the black Muslim movement did the same thing. So legislation evolved that strictly limited research in prisons, but unfortunately, just two months ago, a government panel decided to allow researchers back into prisons. Their recommendation is not legally binding, but everyone believes that um, the government is going to follow their recommendation. So we're about to see a renaissance of these horrible experiments. I'm gonna skip the regulatory history. Radiation experiments were a wide variety done. 
Here, Dr. Clarence Lushbaugh explains why he chose black patients. No money, slum, poorly washed. And uh, the fact that he said this in 1995, I find truly galvanizing. Black children have not been spared the very, very worst abuses. Um, in Dr. Sim's time, 19th century, we find that um, a lot of it was impromptu. A physician would want to demonstrate to his class, to his students, how to do a castration and would simply perform one on a young black boy. Same thing for a trephination, which is the boring of holes in the skull. In 1970, 1969 actually, right here in Baltimore, um, a researcher affiliated with John Hopkins um, devised genetic experiments. He would look at boys with X, XYY complement to see if they were um, prone to violence. But for some reason, he chose 85% black boys for this. Now, this research could have stigmatized them as born criminals. And what I find most chilling about that is just in 1995 in New York City, there was also genetic research that could have stigmatized black boys as criminal criminal and violence prone. But this was performed by, inject, by giving them fenfluramine. Now, fenfluramine was half of that toxic fen-fen weight loss drug combination. It sickened and killed some adult women, but he, they decided to give it to children. But only black boys, I saw the protocol, and white boys were excluded. In my chapter on bioterrorism, I venture into some, something that sounds really like sci-fi territory. It's very difficult to believe, but the protocols and the research are all there. There are very good records. Basically, what's happened is that the U.S. government has been among the um, agents that has exposed people in black communities to biological agents, such as, um, well, we've had mosquitoes who were, um, Anopheles mosquitoes who were transmitting malaria, agents that transmitted yellow fever, all sent over black communities to see whether people would sicken, and indeed they did. In one community, in Carver Village, um, the whooping, death from whooping cough rose like 20 percent within a two-year period. And the whole, the idea behind this was to see whether the U.S. government could use these biologicals as weapons in a war against the Soviet Union. And once again, we have a very chilling recent parallel. Just a few years ago, the trial of Dr. Wouter Bassan ended. Dr. Wouter Bassan was a Johannesburg doctor who was the number three medical man in um, South Africa under apartheid. His initiative was to develop weapons that would pre preferentially cripple and kill black people. He was charged with the murder of hundreds and hundreds of South African and black um, Namibian soldiers. And after a very long trial, he was found innocent, even though all of his white deputies testified against him consistently about the crimes they committed together. Some of these scientists included U.S. scientists, such as Dr. Larry Ford, and others who I can't name because they're quite litigious. And the fact that Wouter Bassan was found innocent, unfortunately, means that it's very difficult to write about this without perhaps facing a libel suit. But it's chilling, and I think it shows that we are not yet shed of some of the um, animus so, where are we now? There are several things going on. One is that the most floridly abusive research of the past is no longer happening. No one is now prying children's skulls. No one is now doing reproductive surgeries on black women um, against their will. And vast populations of black people are no longer at risk. However, that doesn't mean that we're totally safe. There are abusive researches, and some of them do have a racial component. So we do have to continue to be careful. But the challenge now, the dangers now are different, and they include what I call the erosion of consent. Informed consent is the holy grail of research. It's, it's essential to make sure that people understand and agree to medical research. Yet we're beginning to pass laws that water down informed consent. Informed consent is starting to become a thing of the past. For example, in um, 1990, the Department of Defense asked for and received from the FDA a waiver for soldiers 
That meant that from 1990 until its revocation last year, if you're a U.S. soldier, you can be experimented on without your consent. Many soldiers have been court-martialed, thrown out of the army for refusing anthrax vaccinations, for example. And soldiers are not the only people. Emergency department patients. In 1996, the government decided that if you are brought into an emergency department unconscious, you can be subjected to research. And this is actually being done in many places across our country. If you look at Detroit, just two weeks ago, they ended research in which if you're brought into a Detroit hospital, and I believe there are 23 other sites in this country, you're brought into a Detroit hospital unconscious and you need blood, you may be given blood, or you may be given artificial blood, which is not blood at all. And this is very troubling because the decision whether to give you blood or not is not made by a doctor who has looked at your physical state and your medical history. It's made by a computer for randomization purposes. So what we have here is we have the needs of the research trumping the needs of the unconscious patient. Now think about who is brought into emergency departments in dire straits, needing blood, bleeding. Black people. Homicide rate is much higher. Even our accident rate is 25 percent higher than whites. And these hospitals are located in inner city areas. When people such as myself have pointed out to the manufacturers, since the FDA wasn't listening, that this is um, unethical, they responded by saying, well, we have a community meeting and we tell anybody in Detroit who doesn't want artificial blood to wear a blue bracelet. And we hand out the bracelets. When I asked them how many people came to the meetings, they wouldn't answer me. <laughs> so this is a very, very troubling um, trend. It's not abating. It's only going to escalate unless people start voicing their opposition to it. Another problem, in fact, morally our largest problem is the fact that because of the successful matrix of le legislation that controls what can be done to American patients, black and white, a lot of researchers are, tra are going to the third world to conduct research that they can't do here. By doing this, they escape a lot of the legislation. They're much freer in what they can do. There's a very laissez-faire attitude toward research in these countries. And people in the third world are often so desperate for medical care of any kind, they will submit to draconian things that we will not submit to. So there are other issues as well, but these I think are the most important ones, the ones that we should rally around. Paradoxically, African Americans also are encountering problems because we are not being involved in research enough. In the mid-80s, AZT was found by one study not to work for African Americans. As a result, many doctors withheld it from African American patients and warned African Americans, don't take this drug. It won't help you and it has side effects that could harm you. So African Americans, of course, we absorbed this information and later on when a research study was done that did involve enough black people and it showed that it did indeed help us, that the first results were a fluke, people weren't listening. At that point they'd already heard the message, it's dangerous and they're avoiding it. More recently, there was a vaccine that was first announced to have efficacy for black people and Asians. Then the maker reversed itself and said, no, it doesn't. Well, the problem again is uh, insufficient number of African Americans in the trial. I would submit that we can't be sure whether it works or not at this point, but I don't think any more research is going to be done to find out why. Interferon B fails African Americans with hepatitis C. It's the only effective medication for hepatitis C. African Americans have a 20 percent higher rate of hepatitis C, and yet the only medication doesn't work well for us. Why? Because we weren't involved in sufficient numbers in the early trials, and we didn't know that it didn't work well until it was already on the market. And in a twist, the new black heart drug, Bidal, which is not a black drug at all, it will work uh, well for whites or blacks, but the patent for use in whites expires this year. The patent for use in blacks is good till 2020. So it's market forces that are driving its marketing as a black drug. And white people who can benefit from this drug are going to find that either they can't get it or their insurer won't cover it because it will be an off-label use for them. So um, we have to be very, very careful about this neo-racial medicine that's emerging. It's often 
operating to our detriment, even when it doesn't, it's morally wrong, as in the case of Vital. It's morally wrong to withhold a drug from whites because the company can't make money by selling it to them. I, only, I wanted to share with you a little of the language that's being used for this erosion of consent that I speak of. When you hear the words deferred consent, presumed consent, waived consent, consent by proxy, these are meant to make you think that your consent is needed for research study. But in reality, each one of these semantic terms means that you are not um, being asked for your consent, that somebody else is consenting for you. And now I want to talk for a minute about the future. For the reasons I've said, because if we do not participate in medical research, we're going to be left behind, as we already have been, with hepatitis C. It's really important for black people to participate, but we have to participate safely. As I said, the danger has not disappeared. There are still risks. And it's up to each one of us to learn what they are and learn how to engage in safe, self, safe research. And we can do this. Black people have taken charge of a variety of, of medical issues, everything from environmental racism, you know, to AIDS, and we can take control of this too. Um, it's going to be very important for healthcare organizations to start educating people about medical research. If you want to join a trial, how do you find one, and how do you do it safely? Looking in the pages of the Village Voice or reading the ads on the bus is probably not the best way to find a trial that's going to work for you. But there are very effective ways. I have a website, medicalapartheid.com, in which I have a whole primer about how to safely join a clinical trial. And I'm hoping, in fact, I'm quite sure that other organizations are going to follow suit with something directed at black people to help us um, join in medical research and you know, also take our place at the, at the table and enjoy the rich bounty of the American health care system. So I also think our, our country has got to have a system of patient education. People should not have to freelance and teach themselves. When you're a medical researcher, you are trained. Um, I went through a course where I was taught, this is how you do medical research, here are the laws at government, here are some of the cultural and ethical problems. And subjects should have the same advantage. There should be a course that everyone would have to take before volunteering for research to guarantee that you know what you're getting into, what the risks are, and how it can and cannot benefit you. Also, we have an investigational review board system in this country. Their job is to evaluate proposed research by researchers and decide whether it's safe and ethical. And there are 5,000 IRBs in this country. Most of them are not being monitored by the government and we have to change this. Unfortunately, most, many IRBs are good, but they're spotty in quality. A lot depends on the people and the institution. So we need to repair the IRB system. And finally, and most importantly, every one of us has to do whatever we can to try to stem the erosion of informed consent. Informed consent is the ethical lifeblood of research in this country. If we lose informed consent, we will all lose, but especially African Americans, because we have the most to lose. Thanks for listening. First, I want to say good evening, and I truly enjoyed your presentation, um, particularly about um, the devaluing and objectification of African people and sharing that this heinousness and insensitivity towards African life is continuing and spreading throughout the world, and particularly Africa. I wonder, in your research, I read a book a few, um, I heard of, I became aware of a book a few years ago, ironically, through um, C-SPAN's book TV about the history of eugenics mm -hmm. 
and in particularly um, how it originated some um, here in the United States and became exported to Germany and became one of the founding principles of the Nazi party and also disturbingly found out, uh, became aware of um, Planned Parenthood's history in the past involvement with eugenics and whether or not you have any history of that and how it related to African people. Excellent question. I have an entire chapter devoted to that. And it's true. Eugenics was first perfected and widely promulgated in the United States, not Nazi Germany. In fact, the United States scientists had a very warm relationship with National Socialist scientists um, in the Eugenics Institute at Berlin and um, eugenicists here at Cold Spring Harbor and other places in the United States worked closely. Um, U.S. scientists would send to Berlin medical journal articles in which they detailed with great precision um, what genetic complement constituted whiteness. Basically they would say, here's a chart showing who's white enough to vote, who's white enough to marry another white person. And of course this varied from state to state. So some states had a one drop rule. So if you had any black, you know, forebear at all, you were black. Others were a little more liberal and said you could be one thirty second black and we'll still consider you white. And Nazi scientists loved this. This was a very good guidelines for them. Um, also in my chapter on eugenics, I talk about reproduction and reproductive control of African Americans, which is very much a part of eugenics and which continues to be very much a part of eugenics. Um, I think that many people who look at things like um, the forcing of Norplant upon young girls don't think of that a eugenic issue, but it actually is. Uh, the whole manufacture of the crack baby myth, that's a eugenic issue. Uh, there's no such thing as a crack baby. And the research that was used to um, uh, invent crack babies actually dealt with um, cocaine, not crack, and was very shoddy research but it was used to stigmatize an entire generation of not only black women but black children. So um, there's a lot there, a great deal there. And I think your allusion to Planned Parenthood is also very important because I talk about Margaret Sanger. I think sometimes we have a binary issue when we talk about medical ethics, which, by which I mean we're so intent on showing a person was one thing or another thing, we never stop to think that they might be both. And Margaret Sanger was, um, as people say, she was a uh, feminist. And she was a birth control advocate. She was also a eugenicist. She was a very powerful eugenicist who used black people as a foundation for making her eugenics arguments. Thank you very much. Thank I just you. wanted to see what you said about that point. Thank you. Hi. Um, you mentioned a lot about um, the need for African Americans to participate in medical research in terms of the patient aspect. Um, I'm having a different um, kind of like issue with that it's because I work in biotechnology and right now Baltimore has about two billion dollars worth of biotechnology products in the work. Mm -hmm. And the issue that I'm finding is that a lot of African Americans, if they go into the medical uh, field, no respect to doctor, no disrespect to Dr. Wilson, but a lot of times we look at it in terms of a physician part. And where mm -hmm. I'm having problems is there's a lack of an African American, um, I guess for example, think tank to a degree where you have these researchers or doing the basic biological research, or doing basic organic research. I mean, a lot of people saw the excerpt about uh, Dr. Uh, Percy Julian, mm -hmm. you know, last night on MPT. But the fact is, like, he's one of very few, and they're not a lot here. And the problem is, and so I think it's good that you kind of advocate that yeah, people should participate mm -hmm. also on the, um, the patient research. But the problem I'm also having is that, but the, I think a bigger issue is that you need to be more in the control aspect where you're writing, you're kind of defining how the research is done in the first place. Because, I mean, for example, Bido came down, but it wasn't a lot of African Americans out there. There are not a lot of African Americans in a lot of the major, you know, um, you know scientific societies which are actually really like informing the policy. Mm -hmm. you know, and so that's one of the things I think we really need to issue. Like a lot of times with Baltimore, with the $2 billion for the biotech parks, I went to one of the meetings around for the one at Johns Hopkins, and a lot of the residents didn't even know what biotechnology was. You know, so that's like a lot of ignorance on our part and a lot of, I think, a lot that we really don't focus on in terms of, uh, you know, how we should be attacking this issue. But excellent presentation. Though. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you raise a really important question because there is the um, issue of people serving warring cultures. I think if you're a black medical researcher, you do have feet in two cultures. And I'm not sure that there's 
I'm not sure that there's anything everyday people can do about that except what I've suggested because what we've seen from the AIDS, um, what happened with AIDS, the history is that researchers were first doing their traditional role of saying we'll tell you what we're working on, we'll tell you what needs to be devised next. And then we had these very naughty, impudent activists saying no, we're going to tell you what we need. This is what we want you to work on. And they were very effective in getting the drugs that they wanted attention paid to escalated. And that's the role that I envision for us, you know, educating ourselves and then being very vocal and tr affecting the trajectory of the research that's being done. Good point. I thank you very much uh, for your work and for coming here. Uh, I just wanted to make a, a comment. Uh, for those of you who uh, have or have not seen The Good Shepherd, there's a, a moment uh, in that movie where the CIA releases a swarm of locusts, uh, which kind of points to the use of possible infestations of insects. And uh, you know, I'll just leave it to you to comment on that. Oh, no, you've educated me. I didn't know about that. I'm definitely going to see it now. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation, new insights on, on health care. Currently, I'm studying uh, as a student uh, under the Shepherd Pratt uh, Hospital mm -hmm. with regards to uh, trauma and more specifically with youth. And uh, here in Baltimore, you know, as I've stated to some of the others, that we have youth who are born into trauma, living with trauma, and unfortunately are dying as a result of trauma. And in that short lifespan, uh, there's a, a sense or a notion that this is or normal or quote-unquote normal life. And so it seems that when we look at the disorders and the symptoms, be it ADD or cognition attention, eating disorders, uh, sleeping disorders, and the whole host of others, that there seems to be a misdiagnosis as to why the behaviors are as they are. So it seems to me that the system Healthcare and educationally speaking here in Baltimore are looking at the behavior and attempting to treat behaviors rather than looking at the cause of it. And I'm wondering if you can share some insights around the research around misdiagnosis of youth suffering with trauma and dissociative symptoms. Very incisive point. And I think it's so important because if I understand you correctly, you're talking about something that's really troubled me, and that is a tendency when one looks at black children, when the medical system looks at black children, instead of seeing victims, they see perpetrators. They look at children and say, and the implication is that children poison their environment with atavistic behaviors, when in reality, these children are the victims of an ugly, violent environment. I remember that when Dr. Frederick Goodwin made that horrible statement in the 90s about um, comparing black youth to monkeys in the jungle, I think a lot of people were deeply offended by the animus, the mentality that statement um, revealed. But what bothered me the most was exactly that implication. He was speaking as if children, monkeys in the jungle, were creating a jungle instead of having been thrust into one. So I, I think that's a really important point. Thank you for raising it. Um, a few years ago, there was a, a movie called The Constant Gardener which was a fictitious um, account of what happens when a, a major pharmaceutical company went into Africa and tested an unapproved drug on um, African people. Um, and it was, I saw the movie and I really loved the movie, but it was a fictitious account. But a few months later, um, in Nigeria, they found out that Pfizer went, had gone into Nigeria and was um, testing an unapproved drug on some African um, children. Um, it was a brain-wasting drug. And um, when they found this out, it was one of those, um, you know, those groups, do-gooder groups that went and found out everything. But when they found it out, Pfizer said that they had got um, verbal agreements from the government. Then they said they got a verbal agreement from the children's parents. Right. And we know a major corporation would never do anything like that, just get verbal agreements. So what they did was they brought documentation and it was proven 
that the documentation was um, falsified, proven that it was falsified. So these people who um, found out this, they went to the American government and tried to get legal recourse and get them to um, act on it. And the American government refused, the courts refused to take the case at all. So it, it ended up being, this fictional account ended up being a very realistic account and it, um, and it sort of um, confirms what you were saying. It's not so easy to do that here any, as easily as it was to do anymore. So they're actually going to third world countries like Africa, and which I think they're trying to recolonize in many ways myself. All right. So. Yeah. Thank you. And there's actually an additional twist to that story. And that is, that's not the first time that Pfizer has found itself in a U.S. court facing down Nigerian parents. In 1990, Pfizer went to Kano, Nigeria at the height of a meningitis epidemic where children were, were dying in droves. Now, these particular families didn't have access to health care at all. So when scientists descended and said, we're doctors, we have a medication that may save your children, of course the parents assented. So parental assent wasn't even part a question. We knew the parents agreed, but what the parents had not been told was the medication was experimental, and many children died. They died not from meningitis, but from the medication they had been given, which had never been tested in humans before. And they sued Pfizer in Manhattan, on Pfizer's home turf, so to speak, and they lost. But I was really struck by this because I could tell from reading some of the court documents that the same level of, um, same strict level of scrutiny was not being applied to Pfizer that would have been elsewhere. And you will find that often when researchers go to the third world to conduct research, they will often hide behind the verbal agreement, the assent, and they also hide behind something I think especially cynical, which is group assent. They'll say, well, we came to this country, and we, we were going to ask everybody for informed consent, but we want to respect the cultural beliefs. So we went to the head man. They don't mention they gave the head man some money, but they went to the head man, and he gave blanket consent. Or we went to the women's husbands, and they gave consent for everybody in their family. And I'm amazed because why do they suddenly become so culturally sensitive when, <laughs> when it's to their benefit? At other times, they don't exhibit that kind of sensitivity. So I think this is something we're going to be seeing more and more often. Good evening, ma'am. First, I'd like to thank you for your lecture. Thank you. Very briefly, uh, a couple of years ago, I went into a local hospital for a routine procedure, and I ended up in the intensive care unit at another hospital. They had told me that all my organs had shut down. And I had never had a history. I think the only problem I've ever had in my life has been my eyeglasses. And when we asked about why this happened, what happened, uh, they gave about three, maybe four different reasons, and they settled on the reason of blood clot, of a blood clot, a massive blood clot in my heart, which was later, which was actually dismissed by the actual surgeon who had saved my life. Unfortunately, we had a family member who had to be rushed to this hospital. And after staying in that hospital and doing well, uh, maybe not too long after that, she died. And when we were asked the reason, they said it was a blood clot, which this doesn't run in our family. Now, aside from there being other variables at work here, uh, talking to other individuals just casually, I heard similar stories to my own. In the course of your research, have you come across instances where hospitals and physicians have attempted to put the onus of responsibility on the individual, suggesting that there is something in your history, uh, some problem with you that has precipitated your illness as opposed to taking some kind of responsibility for medical malpractice or just a mistake? Well, I'm, first of all, I'm sorry for your loss and I'm sorry for your experience. And I didn't really have to resort to my research to discover this because I've worked in hospitals, you know, for years and years, decades, and I've seen it. And there are two things going on here, and, and one is I'm not trying to exonerate physicians, but the truth is physicians don't deal well with errors. And instead of um, being in a supportive environment where if one is human and makes an error, um, there's often a culture that makes it very difficult to own up to an error. So that's not an excuse, it's not a reason for anybody to ever lie about the reason for a complication or to imply to a patient that there is something wrong with them 
but it's human nature and it's something that happens. I remember once getting blood drawn by the clumsiest phlebotomist on this earth. Okay, my arm was black and blue. She could not get a vial of blood. I want to say, give me the damn thing myself. I'll do it, you know. <laughs> but, you know, what she said after a few minutes was, you've got terrible veins. <laughs> so this is something that happens. And unfortunately, a blood clot is such a common occurrence and can have so many reasons that um, I'm not sure it has a great deal of meaning without being, in, being put in the proper context by a medical expert who could find out what's going on. I would just strongly urge you, if the statute of limitations has not run out, okay, then find a good law firm. Some law firms in, employ physicians and other medical experts to try to find out what happened. Also, thank you for coming, and I'm happy to be here. I'm a student at the University of Baltimore. I have t two questions. One is they're um, pushing um, information so that um, female students could take um, part in the papilloma virus um, situation. Um, it's all at all of our bookstores, everywhere you go, it's there. You know, you need to, to be involved in that. And the second part is recently they had an inoculation of students having who were in the Baltimore City school system having to go back and take chicken pox and um, um, inoculations and all and I'm wondering is that did you see that happening widespread across um, nationally or do you know anything about it just intrinsically being here and what what do you think that's all about um, I mean in inoculations against chicken pox yeah, the, the, only for Baltimore City um, yeah. students, though. Okay, I don't. Inner city students. I don't know the chicken. I can't speak to the chicken pox situation because I don't know anything about it. It's the first I've heard it. I will say, however, that one of the things about Baltimore that makes it a, a really hot button, a very difficult city in terms of research with black people, is that it's an anomaly. You've got a city that's got a huge black population, 82 percent black. You also have a city that has a unique reproductive profile. You've got, in an era where the teen pregnancy rate has been plummeting for decades, and black girls show the steepest decline of any ethnic group, Baltimore is the opposite. In Baltimore, you have a much higher percentage of teen mothers. So, this makes it a very useful city for people with a racial agenda. For people who want to say that there is uh, some kind of pathology around early black childbearing, you know, implying that being black and being having, ch having children early and out of wedlock are the norm, Baltimore is a very convenient city. So in terms of HPV, I do have some things to say, and that is that HPV vaccine is a miracle. We've been praying for this for years. It's a wonderful thing. How can you not love a vaccine yeah, against cancer? That having been said, the HPV vaccine is being yoked to a variety of human rights abuses, in my opinion. They're taking a wonderful thing and they're trying to cram it down people's throats. <laughs> I think that um, that's really not too florid a way to put it because what you're doing is by taking this and first trying to make the case that only virgins will benefit from it. This is a very troubling case. Why, why is there an implication that you have to find a girl very young before she's had sex before you give her the vaccine? We know this vaccine protects men against anal cancers. We know this. We know this vaccine protects adult women because most people who become infected with HPV successfully clear it from their bodies at least once. So that one can have sex, contract HPV, clear it from one's body, and still benefit from the vaccine. And yet, all these people are being ignored, and the focus is only on these very young girls. I don't know why it is, but one of the things you learn very quickly as a journalist is to follow the money. So I don't know why this is, but my first question is, is there some kind of financial advantage for Merck in pushing this vaccine on young girls? And I think that there may be. I don't know. I haven't researched it thoroughly, but my, the things I am going to explore are if the vaccine is administered in the school system, if girls have to have it before they can go to school, and if it's being given by school-based clinics, school-based clinics are perfect sites for research. And that's what happened with Norplant. <laughs> That was a huge research study. When you have a research study, there's enormous pressure put on the people administering it to get 100% compliance. Okay, hence the you know, dictate that you have to have it to go to school. So if we are going to be um, making parents agree, or, or actually 
a lot of proposals are bypassing parental agreement. Okay? So if we're talking about having nine-year-old girls given the HPV vaccine totally independent of their own culture, their own religious beliefs, their own family's wishes, and we're ignoring boys, we're ignoring adult women, we're ignoring, um, you know, adult men, especially gay men who might really benefit from the vaccine, then what is the real reason that the vaccine is being pushed? It's a good thing. I think that everyone should have it who can benefit from it. I also think it should be an individual decision. Other vaccines in which, um, in which are mandated so that children can't say no, these are vaccines for communicable diseases. You know, you have to maintain herd immunity. There's no such dictate with HPV. You know, you're not going to give somebody cancer if you don't get the HPV vaccine. So I think we need to uncouple these two things. We've got a great vaccine, and we've got a very draconian way of administering it, and we need to take them apart and look at each of them individually before we make a decision. Thank you again, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. And thank you, Ms. Washington. At this time, we're asking you to step out front. We'll take you out, and she will be signing. Harriet Washington, author of Medical Apartheid, The Dark History of Medical Experimentation on Black Americans, From Colonial Times to the Present. She was recently interviewed by Democracy Now!'s Amy Goodman. To read or watch the interview, visit democracynow.org.